And at that moment, as I read that passage in the book, I kind of lost my faith in God. For 12 years, I deconstructed the scriptures, I deconstructed God, God actually had deconstructed me. I think that the beginning of my return to faith happened, ironically, watching Mormon stories. Watching it, and I start bawling and crying. I think I could find my way back into Christianity. The modern Christian apologetics now, it, I kind of want to run, run away from that because it spawns a lot of pride and arrogance. There's two ways you can deal with the world. Either you can have the world affect you or you can affect the world. There's an opposition in all things. Without pain and without suffering, we couldn't have happiness. We couldn't have joy. I can tell people, so I read myself out of Christianity in many ways. I do not read myself back into Christianity. This was all the head knowledge, but it was really what the work that he did in my heart. There are Christian Mormons. There are Christian uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. There are Christian Catholics. And there might even be a few Christian evangelicals even. Upon this rock, I will build my church. That word church is ecclesia. So I looked up the Greek word ecclesia and it means assembly. It's not an organization, it's an organism. It's the people, just like the Book of Mormon says. They're the church of the lamb and the church of the devil. Look what happened when Jesus died at the cross. What happened? The veil was torn. That was God's way of saying the idea of having a religious system a priesthood and all this kind of stuff has been torn away and you have access to the Holy of Holies. So all believers have the priesthood, male and female. There are legends that after his resurrection, Jesus visited peasants in Russia. He saved my life. Not only did he save my life in many ways by using Mormonism to save my life, but also he saved my eternal life by the sacrifice that he made at the cross. Hi friends. We just had a really good conversation with Steve Pinacker from Mormon Book Reviews. And we talked about his journey into and out of atheism the characteristics of true Christians, and his upcoming read through the Book of Mormon, which will be pretty exciting. This conversation was inspired in part by something that he'd mentioned to us before about what God was teaching him, about how Jesus affected the world, but wasn't affected by the world, and how we as Christians should be doing the same thing. We should affect the world for Jesus, but we shouldn't be affected by the world. I really feel like the conversation got better as we went, and I pray that you'll be blessed by it. So we're welcoming Steve Pinacker onto our channel here at Book of Mormon Review. Welcome to Book of Mormon Review, where some restorationists are encountering an evangelical. <laughs> Welcome to the program, Steve. Uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, well, thank you both for having me on your program today. Of course, I think our channels will be inexorably linked forever because of the similarities of our names, but also you guys coming on my channel and uh, then me uh, coming on your channel via uh, in an interview that I did of you guys, but also the shorts that you've been making of me. So I feel like we have this close bond as two uh, YouTuber channels that are kind of doing our own unique take on things, which I think is what makes us so perfectly suited for each other. We're kind of unicorns in this space, if you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and so I'm I'm an evangelical Christian. My name's Stephen Pinecker, and I was an atheist for like 20, well, for like 12 years. I left evangelicalism for like 20 years and kind of caught back into it via right around COVID times. And uh, then about a year or so later, a year and a half later, um, in September of 2020, I started having this idea about starting a channel called Mormon Book Reviews. And the inspiration for that was actually this Latter-day Saint who had a book review channel called LDS Book Reviews. And I thought, hmm, I should see if anybody's taken the name Mormon Book Reviews. And nobody had. So I picked the name on, on YouTube. I registered the domain name, name on the, of the website, uh, so mormonbookreviews.com. And I was like, okay, I got the name. And then it was just a matter of saying, okay, I would like to do a channel about my bookshelf and this is representative here of my bookshelf um this tiny this little guy here is basically the size of my book of mormon or a collection of books that i had and the idea was to do like a book review channel so this guy who had lds book reviews he basically um had about 200 or so subscribers 200 250 subscribers and i thought i can't imagine wouldn't it be something to have a channel that had over 200 subscribers that was kind of how I looked at it, right? Like, this is really cool. And I was just, i that was kind of what I was looking at, like doing a little niche channel where I just do like some book reviews of books and maybe I'll have an author or two come on and talk to them. Little did I know what was coming down the pike. As a matter of fact, we're actually heading the end of March. I think this right about this time of year, uh, three years ago is when I released my very first book review, which was a Pentecostal Reads the Book of Mormon which I thought was the most perfect book review to have because it kind of was a convergence of our two worlds, right? Like, so you have um, you have this idea that, you know, you have a Pentecostal, let's see if I can see the book. Ah, you know, um, a Pentecostal theologian named Dr. Christopher Thomas, 
wrote this book, A Pentecostal Reads the Book of Mormon. And Dr. Christopher Thomas is really, uh, without uh, any exaggeration, is one of the top Pentecostal theologians in the world. And here's a copy of the book right there. And this, and, and actually, I got introduced to Dr. Christopher Thomas's work via his appearance on John DeLynn's Mormon Stories. Okay. And I can say that I think that the beginning of my return to faith happened, ironically, watching Mormon Stories and watching this interview, which I believe came out in January of 2020, I believe, on Mormon Stories. And what it was, was basically that day, Dr. Christopher Thomas, who at the time was the president of the Book of Mormon Studies Association, the leading scholarly organization for the Book of Mormon, and he's a Pentecostal. And he got he was having lunch with John DeLynn, and John DeLynn goes to him and says, you know what, let's go to the studio right now and tape an interview. So he ends up that last minute, and they had just gotten the new studio set up where he can do more in-studio interviews. Mm -hmm. And he sits there with Dr. Christopher Thomas and does a three-part episode. Now, here I am. This atheist who's going to be like, well, here's this Pentecostal Yahoo who's about ready to get nailed by John Johnny D, right? And I kind of went in there because Pentecostals, we kind of looked at as being from the other side of the tracks, even though mm -hmm. charismatics come from a more sophisticated evangelical churches. And we come, I come from the Christian reform background, and we kind of looked down on anybody that wasn't, you know, Dutch or a Calvinist. And that was kind of the world that I was in. And here we have this Pentecostal Yahoo from Tennessee who's going mm -hmm. on. Mormon stories. Well, he does a three-part episode, three parts. And I remember watching parts one and part one and think, boy, I really like this Dr. Christopher Thomas. He's kind of a cool guy. And then the second episode comes out and it was really good. But then the third episode happens. And I tell people that's when a church service broke out. See, at that moment, Dr. Christopher Thomas was ministering to John DeLynn. But little did they know that he was also ministering to me. Mm -hmm. So I remember watching this, ep watching it, and I start bawling and crying. And realized at that point is that, you know, if that's the kind of Christianity that Christopher Thomas believes in, I think I could I think I think I could find my way back into into Christianity if 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 along the lines of the kind of Christianity that he was practicing, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of planted the seed watching you know, Mormon stories, a show that makes everybody an atheist, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Supposedly. Yeah. And <laughs> And next thing you know, Dr. Christopher Thomas is ministering to me, and that was kind of the beginning. And I didn't really even realize that until I went on Mormon Stories a couple of years ago and told my story about that and realized as I'm taping, I think, you know, actually, you could argue that the beginning of my journey back into faith was that interview with Dr. Christopher Thomas. So that kind of lays out where I was spiritually. I would have, I may have still, even when I first started my channel, I might have even considered myself an agnostic. You know, I was still in that space where I was just kind of, you know, in the, the, but the Lord was doing a work in me. He's doing, he's still doing a work in me. He's, he's continually making me a new creature and I'm continuing to grow. So that's part of my spiritual walk, you know, but I really do. Oh, and in many ways, when I was an atheist for like 12 years, one of the things that kept me alive was my study of Mormonism. So then mm -hmm. the final episode on Mormon stories I did part five was how Mormonism saved an evangelical's life. So that kind of gives you just the background of my spiritual journey. Um, you know, I suffered a lot of depression in my life. But also, uh, I found solace in studying Mormonism and Joseph Smith and and all the different aspects of Mormonism, and uh, and that kind of laid the groundwork. Little did I know that Lord was kind of prepping me to be positioned in this time and place to kind of be a bridge builder between the evangelical world and the Restoration. And I do mm -hmm. believe that God's hand is certainly on this endeavor. I don't I don't doubt it at all. Okay. Yeah. And what wh what did you learn from atheism? Because I think that's an interesting, like, you know, your story is very interesting because like, I don't know, I don't see many people doing, you know, what you've, what you've done and what you've gone through. So what, what, because I think that you have an interesting point of view on atheists. Um, and I think that you're more sympathetic toward them because, you know, you've experienced that. So what did you learn from atheism? Okay. Yeah, that's, that is a great question. And, you know, I think, Atheism is, I consider, well, first of all, I've had some of the top atheists on YouTube come on my program. One was Aaron Ra, and the other was uh, uh, Michael Shermer, the, the editor of Skeptic Magazine. And I've been reading Skeptic Magazine since I was in high school. Um, actually, just outside of high school. Like I just graduated high school and I started reading Skeptic Magazine. And I just found it to be really interesting. So I've always been kind of somebody who's been a little skeptical of claims and 
and conspiracy stuff. And I'm, I'm more like, hey, let's get to the facts. I want to know, you know, what is true here? What's myth, you know? And I think um, as I uh, went through a lot of just a lot of uh, issues with Christianity, in particular with Christian apologetics, where I realized that a lot of Christian apologetics wasn't really made to actually be like, okay, I just assumed, like, I didn't take much interest in atheism. I paid zero attention to atheism at all. Like, I wasn't even interested in reading their books. Like, it was just this crazy world that, like, who, who in the world could be an atheist, right? Mm -hmm. And so and that was my mindset about atheists. And then I said, I thought, well, you know, I really need to brush up on Christian apologetics because Paul tells us we're supposed to have a ready defense, right? You know, we're supposed to be prepared to give an answer, right, for to, for our faith and what we believe. And I felt convicted, if you will, that I felt like I needed to start studying apologetics because that's what Paul was kind of advocating. And so I just assumed there's all these Christian apologists that were doing this great job battling against the atheists, battling against the secular humanists. And we were just winning all these debates and everything was great. And then I pick up a, a book, a Christian apologetics book, uh, The New Evidence that Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. And I realized that I felt that the arguments he was making were quite flimsy. And I also felt that the purpose of uh, Christian apologetics at that time, and I, and I think there has been some improvements since then, but basically, the purpose of Christian apologetics was not to reach people or win win in the public square, but it was to keep people in the church mm. and get just good enough answers, just good enough to keep people in the church. But that wasn't good enough for me. And so I studied um, biological evolution. I studied science. I threw myself. I wanted to know everything that I could so I could get a, a sense of uh, things. And as a result of me kind of moving away from um, conventional evangelicalism that I actually kind of would have probably been leaning more towards being a progressive Christian at this time. And then I started reading the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, the Four Atheists, which is uh, Den Dennett, Dawkins, Hitchens, and Harris. And I read all their books. I read all the new atheist materials that were really popular in the mid-aughts, right? And I just remember reading um, Sam Harris's book, A Letter to a Christian Nation, and he wrote this book and basically said that essentially that progressive Christians were the worst because they're giving cover for the fundamentalist acts, excesses of religion. Mm -hmm. And so we are giving them legitimacy. And at that moment, as I read that passage in the book, I kind of lost my faith in God. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I was an atheist. And there was no scenario in which I could, could think of that I could think of that I would actually go and re-embrace my christianity mm -hmm. so it's it, to me it is kind of a, a miracle and i tell people i say you know for 12 years i deconstructed the scriptures i deconstructed god but turns out that god was actually had deconstructed me mm -hmm. see i had to go the i had to take the hard way you see yeah, yeah because of my stubbornness because i'm an okay. alpha, because i'm an alpha male because i'm a type a personality because i'm all these types of thing and i'm puffy and arrogant and think i know everything and this is as a christian right mm -hmm. and then and then as an atheist <laughs> yeah. i was talking with someone the other day and about how um well you know grow, growing up i just thought that people who didn't believe in god or people who left their religion or, or whatever, were just bad people. And they, they were angry and they hated God and they hated the truth and, and they just didn't want it, you know? And, but I feel like I've come to realize that often the people who, um, who, who go that route that you, that you're talking about, um, they have integrity and they're, they're trying to follow what, what, what is right. And mm -hmm. often they are, they are pursuing truth. And I think it's really interesting to see how God can use that, how, like, how God is using Mormon stories in, like, like he used Mormon stories to reach you. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't think that, like, it, it's counterintuitive to us, but he, he can use anything because, because he's omnipotent and, and omnipresent and he, he knows what he's doing. So. Amen to that. I would say God will use any uh, broken vessel afforded to him. And mm -hmm. I say broken, I mean that. Which we process. all are. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the key thing is we have to recognize that um, in our brokenness, that's where that's where, where we can find him. We can't find them if we think we know everything. We can't we can't we're not a seeker if we think we have all the answers. 
And this, mm -hmm. this goes from all, all different philosophical aspects. This isn't just me. There are many, many Christian apologists who literally think they know everything. Mm -hmm. They've got it all figured out. And they're not interested in even having a conversation with me. And I see, look at their fruits, and I don't see any fruits of the Spirit. The fruits that I see are arrogance, um, just cruelty, name-calling, disrespecting people where they're at. I, 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 I interviewed a rabbi who told me that he, he, he does a lot of stuff with the main uh, the LDS church in Utah, and he was at their general conference, and there are all these evangelicals that were holding these signs, and they were just bashing and making fun of the Latter-day Saints, and they had their temple garments hanging and and then he says i approached them because i wanted to see what makes these people tick and he's and he's a rabbi he's got you know he's got his he's got his he looks like a rabbi right yeah he, he says they started attack attacking my garments if you will mm. and my faith so so for me it's like the picture of christianity that is being presented to a lot of people is one that's very ugly very intolerant and not willing to have a conversation that because you know what they got it all figured out well, once you think that, that guess what? That becomes idolatry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because now you've said, oh, my God is my knowledge that I've acquired. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I am not interested in hearing about any knowledge or wisdom that you've acquired no. because it's going to maybe contradict mine. Well, that's that's idolatry. That's that's uh, that's 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 really not good to feel that you're in your own mind. You've got it all figured out. And therefore, I don't need to go on a Zoom call to have a conversation with Steve because I've already got it figured out and I don't think he's a real Christian. Imagine oh, yeah. thinking that you can position yourself in a pl position that you can actually say, I don't think you're a Christian. I'll never say that. Yeah. I think that person's a Christian, but they question whether I do because of the church mm -hmm. I go to or because of some views that I espouse. And that's just not Christian. I've been talking with a, a, a Catholic friend recently, and we were both talking about how um, we're, we've kind of, gotten disgusted with uh christian apologetics nowadays because um not that there's anything wrong with christian apologetics but the people who go into apology a lot of people that we see go into apologetics they they go in there and then they think that they have you know god figured out and that they have all this knowledge and stuff like that but they're like like you said they're missing they're ignorant they're prideful and they're missing the they think that they have god figured out um but then they're missing the key things like love and having charity and um, being humble. And so we were just both talking about that. And I'm talking with, you know, I was talking with this Catholic friend and um, it's kind of been interesting to be able to see someone, this is a, actually a friend who's my age and she converted to Catholicism, which is from Protestantism. So I was like, Oh, okay. That's interesting. Um, I've never really talked with a Catholic. So that's been really interesting, but um, yeah, we, I, I don't like the, 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 the modern Christian apologetics. Now it, I kind of want to run, run away from that because it, it just it it spawns a lot of pride and um arrogance yes it does and i think that that and that's why i went to r and Ra, and i think i also went to michael Shermer and went to both of them and said i am a pro atheist evangelical and you should have seen r and Ra's eyes get really big and r and Ra, he's got the long black hair he's got mm -hmm. the beard he looks like a satanist i think he recently joined the satanic temple you know this is one of those people and and he's an interesting dude you know but but I had him on because he was doing a deconstruction of the Book of Mormon on his channel. Mm -hmm. But I also gave him props because he not only did a deconstruction of the Bible and the Book of Mormon, but he did a deconstruction of the Quran. Well, any atheist that's willing to take on, see, most atheists are cowards in that way. Most atheists, they'll, they'll go after Christianity, mm -hmm. but they'll keep their mouth shut about atheism. Well, to our and Ra's credit, he went and read through the Quran and deconstructed the Quran. Well, in my book, you're a legit dude. Like, I feel like you got integrity and you're willing to put your, your neck out there. And so I was like, okay, I want to have this guy in my program and I want to have a conversation with one of the leading atheists. And I go to the letter, Faith of Latter-day Saints. I said, why would I have Aaron Ra, who hates my religion too? He, he's, he, has, he has no use for any religion, right? Why would I have him on my program? And I said, the reason why I'm having him on is, guess what, Mom and Dad? Your kids are going to learn about the Book of Mormon by watching R and Ra's deconstruction of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so you need to be aware of the information that's out there, and you need to get to know some of the leading critics of the church. And mm -hmm. I feel, and, and the Book of Mormon. And I think mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's good for people to be informed about the criticism so that then they, they, can, they can understand where somebody's coming from. And then yeah. I also I say I'm a pro-atheist evangelical. I'm also stating that in the context of 
there are people that have suffered religious and spiritual PTSD who've been hurt by the church. And this, this is across the board. This can be Catholic, this can be Protestant, this can be any, any number of churches. So I'm not picking on any Islam, any, any religion. There have been people that have been uh, treated very terribly and, and, and by churches, organizations, and individuals who are claimed to speak for God or claim to have some kind of authority. And they hurt people in the name of God. And sometimes people who are in that space almost have to, for their own mental well-being, almost have to become an atheist at that point because even the concept of God they find triggering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I do not recommend that somebody stay in the angry atheist phase their entire life. And there are people that do stay in that space, that occupy that space. And I think anger and is not a good space to be in. I think when people lose their faith, they, they go through their anger phase, which is understandable because they feel like they've been lied to. They feel like they've been things have been misrepresented to them. And so I really feel like, so a lot of in, individuals, when they encounter atheists, uh, Christians or other people, it's those atheists are going through their angry phase. Most people then kind of learn to tamp down the anger and make peace with the, their the, their past and, and, and sometimes eventually end up not having a negative view of religion uh, eventually. And sometimes they find their way back into faith, right? Mm -hmm. And really, I honestly I tell people, I even tell atheists this, I said, listen, you know, if you just take a, uh, a strain of Protestantism to its logical extreme, it would lead to atheism. Once you as a Protestant are literally going against the vicar of Christ on earth and saying, you have no power over me, uh, you're only one or two steps away from becoming an atheist, right? In one sense. So for me, a, a, a athe Western-based atheism is actually a type of Protestantism taken to its logical extreme. So I often go to atheists and say, welcome to the Protestant fold. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I have fun with that. But I think that's a legitimate way to look at it. And even Christ Christopher Hitchens, who's still one of my favorite writers of all time. No, I am an atheist of the Protestant variety, is how mm -hmm. Christopher Hitchens mm -hmm. described himself. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a strain of Protestantism that's embedded in atheism. And really, I tell people, I said, look, there are atheists who go and say, this world is broken. This world is a mess. This world is unfair and unjust. And I don't want to have anything to do with a God that would have had anything to do with it. Therefore, I don't think there is a God. Because if mm -hmm. there was a loving God, this world wouldn't be the mess that it's in. And honestly, that sounds like a very Christian statement. We live in a broken world. We live in an unjust world. They identify the very problem issues that a lot of Christians also identify too, is that the mm -hmm. brokenness and 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 just the the senselessness of, of the needless death and suffering that happen, that yeah, atheism to me in that sense makes sense that and even even Christopher Hitchens says I am not an atheist I'm an anti anti theist he's like I'm against the God if there is God I'm against him because he put he he created this mess. Well, you know, those are harsh things to be said, but I do think that they are legitimate criticisms that we need to at least consider. So to me, I have a much more charitable view of atheists than most people do, only because I know that the things that people say about atheists, like, well, they do it because they want to sin. They want to do it because of this. And they give all these reasons. But you know what? 99% of the time, the people, and whether it's Mormon, evangelical, whatever, when they have friends or family that become atheists, they never go to them and say, why do you become an atheist? Why? Yeah. Because they are afraid Mm -hmm. hear what they're the threatened. their yeah. faith is threatened so that tells me you don't have a strong faith mm -hmm. see if you have a weak faith you don't want to you don't want to learn things you just yeah. want to be in your little comfortable little bubble if yeah. you have a strong faith you're not afraid to engage the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and you know like we talked about the other day how you know i am a worldly person i think i'm worldly wise but i said you know we are part of this world right we exist in this space and I said, there, there, there's two ways you can deal with the world. Either you can have the world affect you yeah. or you can affect the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the way I look at it is I feel that for most people, including myself, for a good part of my life, I let the world affect me. But God showed me and he, while he's making me a new creature, he says, no, you can affect the world by allowing Christ's work that he's doing through you. Again, again, works. It's not the works that we do. It's the work that he's doing in us. That's the whole point mm -hmm. of works and grace, right? It's, so if people see Christ operating in your life, guess what happens? You can be a Christian and be friends with an atheist. You can be a Christian Absolutely. be friends with you can be friends with a Satanist. You can be mm -hmm. you can you can be friends and you can dialogue with people. And if you have that boldness of the Lord working through your life, you have nothing to fear. 
Yeah. So so when I see Christians that don't have atheist friends, I'm like, are you really affecting the world or is the world affecting you? Mm -hmm. And that means like, do I cut off people that disagree with me or do I embrace them like Jesus would? I mean, heck, we, we freaking killed him and he still wanted to have gave us the time of day. Well, about that, uh, I was actually thinking about that. And back to what you were saying about Christopher Hitchens, I think you said that he's the one who said that, you know, um, who he's anti-theist because he doesn't want to have anything to do with a God who would allow all the things to happen. And I was actually, and that is a, that was, that is a valid question. Um, and I think it's appropriate to ask that, but I think a good answer to that is, um, John Lennox, uh, 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 a professor from Oxford. He's a mathematician, you know, he's a Christian. Um, I was listening to something that he said recently and he said, you know, people have problem with God has have a problem with God because they see all these bad things that happen on this earth, and so they're like, "Oh, I don't want to have anything to do with a God who would allow all these things to happen." Well, he said something really interesting. He said, "Well, yes, but we what happened two thousand years ago? We see God coming down and suffering with us in this pain and in this suffering and in all the the bad things that happened in this earth. He was even killed, like what you just said. He hasn't remained distant from our suffering. Mm -hmm. He came to be part of it. Yeah." And another, my another, another response that I would respond to that is, well, yes, there is a lot of suffering. There's a lot of pain down here, but the, what does the Book of Mormon say? It says, it says that there's an opposition in all things. And so without pain and without suffering and without um, all the bad things that happen on this earth, we couldn't enjoy, we couldn't um, have happiness. We couldn't have joy. We couldn't have um, all the things that we enjoy on this earth. We wouldn't enjoy it because it would just be, if we didn't have um, bad things that happen. Yeah, like some of the most, some of the most beautiful souls that I've come across and or met in my life, um, the most empathetic people, the most loving people are the people who have been through really traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. And so they know how to identify with other people and, and, and they have a heart to help other people. And they couldn't have, um, they, they couldn't, gain that that experience and that empathy and that that love had they not been through things like that themselves mm -hmm. yeah and I, I will tell people i said i would not recommend taking the path that i took because it was kind of hellish you know and difficult mm -hmm. and i think that that's the thing that's what when look that's and, and john lennox by the way he debated christopher hitchens back in the day you should probably look oh. up some of his old debates on okay uh, yeah we should um mm -hmm. but uh i think this is the thing you know christianity and Mormonism and stuff have been grappling with the problem of evil almost from the beginning. Like, why is there evil? Why is there suffering? And Christianity is has an attempt to answer the question. Mormonism makes an attempt to answer the question. And are these answers good enough to a non-believer? For some, it they are convincing, but for many, it's not convincing. And we have to be respectful of where they're at because they're like saying, well, why would God require a human sacrifice, right? Like, why, why? Why would a loving God require a human sacrifice in the first place, right? So, so, so it's 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 it, they you know there's questions that they can push back on that, and so I I grapple with those questions too, and I think it's important that we do that because mm -hmm. I feel like you know there is needless suffering that happens, mm -hmm. that 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 does happen, like you know and then there's childhood cancer, um, there's there's animals that are suffering you know, right now, and we'll never know about it. We'll never experience it. it, it it's lonely. And that uh, that poor animal is suffering right now as we speak. Right now, there's a child being brutally raped. And they might be calling out for God, and God isn't there in that room to save them. So we have to deal with the problem. Maybe we need to real recognize that is a real problem. And we as Christians have to grapple with it. These are the hard questions we have to deal with. Now, like I tell people, I said, I read myself out of Christianity in many ways. I do not read myself back into Christianity. See, I was all, it was That's all about really up here. Yeah, it was all, this was all the head knowledge. But it was really what the work that he did in my heart, right? And to change me. Mm -hmm. And so I really feel like I'm not interested. Look, we, we have to acknowledge the hard questions. We can't just gloss over the suffering that happens in this world. And, and just think that maybe our answers are good enough. For a lot of non-believers, those are not good enough answers. So mm -hmm. now we have to recognize that, look, I understand where you're at. I get why you would not believe in God. And I'll go to an atheist and say, I will grant you every single point. 
I will, I will, I will, I, I will agree with 99% of what you have to say, probably. But then I say, but let's just talk about the fact that we are spiritual. Um, human beings are, are, were created to be spiritual. There's no question about it. We all have a spiritual side to us. Some say this gave us an evolutionary advantage and that's why we're here. Uh, uh, um, maybe, I don't know, but, but, but it does tell you that within the context of humanity, it's our spirituality and our belief in something bigger than ourselves that got us here. And so to deny that part of our humanity and just go full-blown atheist, you're literally cutting yourself off from the spiritual aspect all humans have within them. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I tell atheists, you know, don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, 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 you know, try to meditate and try, try to do practices that could be fulfilling to you or helpful to you. Don't just completely poo-poo the idea that there's spiritual, that there's more to life than just this, than the material universe, that there, there has to be something in many ways, there is something bigger than us that we can't even comprehend or understand whether there's a God or not. It's incomprehensible that we're here, right? In one sense, it's all so improbable that it makes you feel grateful and in awe that we are, it's a miracle that we're even having this conversation in one sense, right? Whether you believe in God or not, this is a miracle conversation that we're having. Mm -hmm. Life is really, truly remarkable. And it could be that we're the only planet in this vast universe that actually has intelligent life. We have yet to find any elsewhere. So that makes it even more incomprehensible. And you know, I'm open to the idea there's life on other civilizations. There might be advanced civilizations. I'm, I've always been interested in all that kind of stuff too. But it's just as likely that this is it. Mm -hmm. And so that makes the improbability of our existence even that much more greater, which would then say, okay, were, are we the result of an accident or was there a guiding hand in this whole process? Yeah. So I think these are the great questions we can ask. But I do think that it's important that we, we engage atheists with an open mind and just recognize that they are, in one sense, truth seekers themselves. They want to get to the bottom of it. And maybe for them, they may have st studied. And look, many atheists know the Bible better than most Christians do. Yeah. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. And so we have to recognize that they aren't, it's not a, becoming an atheist is not a superficial. Now, yeah, there's the kid in high school, right? Who's an atheist or he's a Satanist because he wants to attract attention and be the bad boy, right? We all know those types growing up. But to be somebody who may be in the faith for a very long time and deep and deeply embedded in that faith, becoming an atheist, it wasn't because of some 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 kind of superficial thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's often there's very good reasons for them to become atheists. But that's just yeah. that's just how I say. I think we need to be more charitable towards people that have different persuasions. Plus, atheism is also what I would call a faith journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's it's really important for people from all sides to have humility and to be able to say, you know what, I don't know. But but and, and to be willing to to look into the, themselves and, and try to find good answers, because so many times we just want to look at people's problems uh, like from 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 a whole, lots of different perspectives, like from whether you're talking about um, people who are dealing dealing with health issues or people who are dealing with relationship issues or religion issues or financial issues or whatever. And, and we just want to look at them and, and fix them really fast. And because we want it to be convenient for ourselves, like we want to just give them an answer to their problems instead of um, like really talking with them and, and asking them, I don't know, like, like what, asking them how they feel and, um, and really empathizing with them. We just want to give them a, a quick solution so that, so that we can check it off our list. Um, and so I feel like from, from both sides, like from atheism and from a, a perspective of faith in God, we have to have humility and um, be able to acknowledge when, when we don't know something, because there are so many, like one of the, th the biggest things that I think drives people away from Christianity is when um, Christians are, well, so so-called Christians are like humanists in Christians' clothing. I, I feel like they they take the name of the Lord in vain because they're they're using Christ's name, but they're not like Him at all. They're not emulating Him because what did Jesus say? Like by this ye shall know, if, shall men know yet ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. And that's that's like the essence of what what is at the like the very essence of real Christianity. But so many Christians are hedon or are um sorry uh, humanists like worshiping the self and elevating the self, and then they just take this cloak of piousness and 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 put it around themselves. And and then other people see that and they're like, if that's Christianity, I don't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to push back a little bit on that because I would say that I would consider myself a Christian humanist. And okay. I I actually had a college professor who uh that was a history professor and he and he was he was a humanist. He did not believe in God, but you know what he says? He says, I am pro-life, anti-abortion, because I'm a humanist. So humanism actually comes out of the Christian worldview. And that is, it gave us the uh, Renaissance period. It gave us uh, the Enlightenment values that we live in a post-Enlightenment, post-Renaissance world. So the idea that humanism is, was, came out of a Christian idea that we are made in God's image. So, so I think it's really important that there's Christian humanism and then there's secular humanism. I think Christian humanism is about look at the, the looking at the the look we are in one sense at the center of creation humanity right we were god breathed unlike the rest of creation so the idea of being a humanist is not necessarily problematic um I do think that we 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 sometimes might confuse selfishness or hedon, hedonism or other things um actually even even CS Lewis said he was a Christian hedonist as well so that's another interesting <laughs> One way to look at it too, but I think it's just really important that, like, like, yeah, I would say I am a Christian humanist in the sense that I believe that God, you know, we are image bearers, so I want to love all of humanity, and it's not about loving myself; it's about loving my fellow man. That's how I view humanism. I do think that there are secular aspects of humanism that maybe that's not the case, but generally speaking, uh, humanism can be a highly ethical system, whether you believe in God or not. Even in, even even in the sense that I could have a college professor who doesn't believe in God but but is anti-abortion. Uh, you know, so so I think it's, it's it gets much more complicated than that. I just want to just kind of share with you my my thoughts on that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, earlier I was thinking about the part in the Book of Mormon, um, because what what we've talked a lot on our channel about is that we don't want other Christians coming and bashing us and saying that we're not Christians right. when they haven't taken a look at the Book of Mormon. And I think it's very important for people who are um, skeptical of uh, Christianity to not just look at, at so-called Christians, but to look at the Bible and, and see what the Bible for it, itself says. And for us as Christians to look at what the Quran says and have an informed opinion about that instead of just wanting to make it easy for ourselves and look up, like Google all the arguments against the Quran or whatever, mm -hmm. and then just, just repeat those with, like not coming from an informed perspective, but an uninformed perspective. Right, right, exactly. So we want to engage the the holy texts of all the different religions. And the reason why we want to do that is because, um, first of all, we as Christians and believers should not be afraid of other believers. We that we share that in common with Muslims as well. They believe in God and they believe in Jesus. They believed in the second, they believe that Jesus will be returning. You know, uh, they mm -hmm. believe in the second coming of Jesus, as like Christians do. Now, there's a lot of differences, obviously, between the Muslim world and the Christian world, but they are part of the Abrahamic uh, tradition, right? They are Abrahamic. A, a, they come from the Abrahamic tradition and they're fellow monotheists as well. So I feel like there's commonalities that we can have with Muslims. And I say this not because I'm trying to tell people like all religions will get you there and all this kind of stuff. I look, I'm not. I just believe that there are followers of Christ in every single religion. And I, and in my mind, I feel like, I think there are, there are Christians, uh, there are Christian Mormons, there are Christian uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, there are Christian Catholics, there are Christian uh, uh, Muslims and Jehovah's Witnesses and lists, and there might even be a few Christian evangelicals even. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I feel like the body of Christ is not the building or the organization or the, the building that you go to on Sunday. The body of Christ are the believers, the followers, the seekers. Yeah. And I feel like there's seekers and believers in all these communities. And I don't think that we should be afraid to engage other people, other people of other faiths and their scriptures, because there can be wisdom in those scriptures as well that we can learn from. But also because if we really truly want to engage our fellow image bearers, then we need to be respectful mm -hmm. of their faith tradition, where they're coming from. And you know what? When they see when they see Christians doing that, they're much more interesting in having a conversation with us about Jesus than these Christians are saying, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. I got a Bible that tells you you're going to hell. Or a Bible, a Bible. We already got a mm -hmm. Bible, right? We don't need no Book of Mormon, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we have that. Well, you know what? I'm sorry, but that's not going to facilitate a conversation. It What it does is this causes the image bearers to be in contention with each other. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, who is who is sowing that? Right? When you're doing contention, the question I have for you, who are you really working for? Why would you, <laughs> as an image bearer, a child of God, God breathe, why would you attack fellow image bearers? Mm-hmm. Well, the because Book of Mormon slight... says that the spirit of contention is not of Christ. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, that's, and that there that's... are only two churches, the church of the devil and the church of the Lamb of God. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't think that that means literal building institutional churches. No, I think no. it tells us about there's two worldviews out there. Well, we were talking with um, an apostle from another rest- restoration branch, and he, I felt he, like he made some really good points. He said that, um, like, so he was talking about this whole thing with the church, and he said that so many churches want to say that they're it. And he said, mm-hmm. we're not it, we're part of it. And he's one thing I, he said really stuck out to me. He said that we're not, an, the church is not an organization, it's an organism. Mm. And, um, so I, after that, I was reading in, let's see, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And this really stuck out, stuck out to me because I'd heard, um, I'd heard about this, the Greek word ekklesia in the New Testament. And so in Matthew um, 16, 18, Jesus says, and I say also unto thee, well, so, you know, Peter, uh, Jesus has been asking his disciples who they say that he is. And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my father who is in heaven, which is in heaven. And then he says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, which restorationists believe is the rock of revelation, you know, the, uh, the father revealing to people who the son is, um, I will build upon this rock. I will build my church. And so that word church and uh, in, in several times in the New Testament and the Old Testament, that word church is ecclesia. And so I looked up the Greek word ecclesia and it means assembly. It's not like an, it's not an organization. It's an organism. It's the people. So it can be a political assembly. It can be just a gathering of believers. And in all the definitions for that word ecclesia, I didn't find one that was talking about an organization. Mm -hmm. And so then, yeah, it, it just really blew my mind. I was thinking, yeah, like, just like the book of Mormon says, there's the church of the lamb and the church of the devil. It's not, it's not a brick and mortar. It's not, it's not a 501c3 tax deductible. No, it's not any of that. It's like, yeah, an assembly. Yeah. And like this apostle said, he said, uh, the other thing, um, we're not part of the church. We are the church. The people, the believers are the church. Where two or more are gathered in my name, I am with you. Mm -hmm. And I was taught by an apostle from England in the 1990s, this taught, he says, that's the church where two or more are gathered. He says, when you are having a conversation with a fellow believer, you're having church service. Yeah. So in one sense, you we are having a church service right now because we're fellow image bearers here in Jesus's name and we're having a conversation with each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I really feel that's 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 how rat. Yeah, I've, I've taken a very radical approach to this, too. That's why I never, ever joined a church organization. I've attended church services, but I've never formally joined a church. So I've been living mm-hmm. this principle my entire life. And so for me, it just seems weird. It's like, why why would you judge somebody by what building they go to? Why don't you look? And Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruits. Mm-hmm. Well, let's just look for the fruits. If somebody goes to me, and I even as a young kid, I said, if anybody goes to me and says, I am a Christian, I'm going to take them at their face value. Okay, you're a Christian. I don't care what you are. Orthodox Christian, Jehovah's Witness, whatever. You, you claim to be a Christian. Now, let me just see the fruits. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what he said. That it's really simple. I know mm-hmm. it's not like, well, do you believe in the this creed or this formula of the Trinity? Uh, you know, all these kind of things, like this, this, and this. And it has to be correct doctrine, correct belief. And it's like, that's all works. Mm-hmm. People don't get it. Like, if I have to have correct doctrine and correct belief and everything like that, then what's the point of Jesus dying on the cross if it's about having correct doctrine and correct belief? No, it's about having correct relationship. One. Mm-hmm have a, a correct relationship with reality and a correct relationship with the savior and what he did for us at the cross. And then there's nothing that we could do to earn what he did for us at the cross. Once you can get that understanding of what, what this is all about, what grace is, and that it's a free gift that then that liberates you from the idea that you have to do religious practices to have a conversation or a dialogue with the divine. Yeah. And the reality is you don't have to do anything any religious or look when Jesus look what happened when Jesus died at the cross what happened the veil was torn in the temple mm-hmm. 
And that, that was God's way of saying the idea of having a religious system of priesthood and all this kind of stuff has been torn away. And you have access to the Holy of Holies, direct yeah. access to the Holy of Bringing Holies. Bringing us into the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but then we have the, uh, the, the priesthood of all believers. So all believers have the priesthood, male and female. That's the reality. I, I don't remember her name. The woman from um, uh, Book of Mormon Cent Central. I can't remember her name, but I was watching a video from her and she was making that same point. And a faithful LDS woman was saying that, you know, when when LDS people go, uh, go through the temple, they're anointed to become priests and priestesses. And so that is a pre they're part of a priesthood, mm -hmm. even the men and the women. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's any doubt, you know, in my mind that that's what was the intent, right? So again, I'm not saying this to be critical of hierarchical churches and patriarchal churches. And for some people, they 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 want that structure in their life. There are people, I had a friend who suffered from like ADHD or whatever he had, or maybe he was on the spectrum and he attended, he loved attending high church Episcopalian church services because he found that all of that was very calming to his soul. So I'm not going to judge you and say, well, no, you're going to the wrong building this Sunday. No, it's like, no. Wherever you find uh, where you can have uh, solace and have a conversation with the divine and have it direct you in your life. Some people need the smells and the bells, right? The smells and bells that you see in the Catholic church. Some people want to be, um, you know, encounter God in different ways. I just feel it's important that you be respectful of the people and then also say, but don't go and say, well, my way or the highway. In other words, my born again experience or my church that I go through is what I judge by everybody else. So if you didn't have the exact same born again experience that I had, then I question whether you're a true Christian or not. That's garbage. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say, no, you say you're a Christian. Okay. I'm just going to look for the fruits. Yeah, and absolutely. What's so crazy is I see so many fruits in the restoration. So many wonderful people that exhibit all the Christ-like attributes that I would want to find in another human being. And so I can't mm -hmm. deny the Christianity of these people or the very fact that Jesus is working their lives. Mm -hmm. Then I can engage Christian apologists and literally have never seen one single fruit. So yeah, that, yeah. that to me... That's just, it's not that difficult. It really isn't, mm -hmm. you know? And because they don't, you, they don't usually, um, people don't sense love from the other side coming no. at them. So if they don't sense the fruits of the spirit and the other person, why should they listen to them? Why in the world do most ex-Mormons become atheists? Right? Yeah. Why? Well, they become atheists because they go and see what people do in Jesus's name on my side. They see the taunting of the, the Latter-day Saints at the General Conference and at the temple openings and people they're walking and, say, and they're looking at this and they're like, you know, if I were to ever leave this church, I will definitely not go and join their church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're actually doing more harm than good doing what they're doing. And so to me, that's, that's a spirit of contention that is not of the Lord. What they're doing, many of them, I do know that there are some sincere people out there that are doing street ministry and all this, and they're sincere. And I and I don't question their sincerity nor their Christian faith. But I do question a lot of what I see and look at the rotten fruits that they're producing and recognize like, man, if you really think that this is what you're doing is getting people into, I, say, I think to myself, you're pushing people out of the kingdom when you act mm -hmm. that way. So I feel just like, you know, and my good friend, John DeLynn, you know, he said, we could all use epistemological humility, right? In other words, we think yeah. we know everything. Well, no, we don't. Actually, we we know a heck of a lot less than we than we even think we know. Like, we need to recognize that even if we think we know a lot, we really don't know much yeah. at all. And mm -hmm. so a lot of people, they have a little bit of information. They think that makes them an expert. That makes them a great apologist. It makes me, I can go and debate atheists. I can go and debate Latter-day Saints. I can go and debate whoever, Muslims, whatever. And it's just, it's just a fool's errand at, mm -hmm. at that point. And I really feel it's about their ego and like they're puffed up. That Look at me. I'm taking those people on. I'm winning this argument. I'm doing this. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. But I don't see any of Jesus. I don't no. see any Jesus there yeah. either. Yeah, I was, I started reading a book on logic by Isaac Watts. You know, he, he wrote so many of the, mo the most beautiful Christian hymns and he was just brilliant, just brilliant. Um, and at the very beginning of his book on logic, he talks about how the first uh, the first step toward gaining knowledge is um, taking it like sitting down and thinking to yourself how much you don't know. Like, look at that blade of grass that that you know 
on the lawn and do you know like everything that god did to make make that grow and all of the cells and the molecules and how it all works no or like think about space and and th think about all of the um the different facets of, of of the scientific world that you have no idea about and he said that like the first thing toward toward gaining knowledge is to be be humble and teachable Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen to that. Is it being, and that's the one thing I love about, you know, I, and then again, this is not just Christian apologists. I've had Latter-day Saint apologists go after me and attack me and uh, think they have it all figured out too. And, and also attack me because I have the wrong type of Mormon on my program. You can't have those heartlanders on there. You know, it's like, no, I can have whoever I want. But the beautiful thing is when I look at somebody like Richard Bushman, who's a man in his nineties and he's still a student, he's still learning. When he, when he, when I talk to him at Mormon History Association, I almost every year, he just comes up and says, how's the channel doing? He wants to know like, okay, what kind of people are you reaching? Tell me more, tell me more. And, and, and when I interview Richard Bushman, it's as much about him wanting to learn about me as me about him. And mm -hmm. so he's a student to, and even the, and the most premier Mormon scholar, I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than Richard Bushman. He is at the very top, but yet yeah. he's still a student and there's wisdom. There's a wisdom in that man that we all can tap. Richard Bushman is... Truly one of the most remarkable minds I've ever engaged. Um, and I'm privileged to learn that the best scholars are not the ones that have the answers. The best scholars that are, are the ones that are still asking questions. Hmm. Yeah. Like what did Jesus call the people who he chose to follow him and to be his leaders? He called them disciples. Like that comes from the the Greek, Greek discipulus, which means student. So the, the people, he, he chose these fishermen who made this huge impact on all of world history and were able to do these amazing things through him and, and affect so many people's lives and knew way more than we do. And who were, were they? Discipulus. They were students. Mm -hmm. Many of them couldn't even read and write. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. they, were, they were students. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question for you, Steve. Yeah. Your channel is named Book of Mormon, uh, Mormon Book Reviews. I always get ours mixed up. Um, <laughs> how many... How many books have Mormon Mormonism books have you read? And um, when will you finish or are you going to finish reading the Book of Mormon? OK, so and I want to the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. So so I have read I, I can't tell you, but it has to be in the. It has to be in the thousands, probably of wow. books and books and papers that I've read uh, articles. It would it would have to run into the thousands. I, I, you know, just by doing this for a few decades, a couple decades, well, how long it's been, it's good, been most good part of my life, right? Probably about a half of my life. I don't know. So I would say it goes into thousands. Yeah. I want to give you, thank you for bringing that up. I've been in touch with Nehemia Gordon, who's one of the top Hebrew scholars in the world. And we're intending on doing a read through of the book of Mormon. And we're going to start with Mosiah and then we're going to do the Mosiah priority because that's in the order that the Book of Mormon actually was produced. The, the, the beginning part actually was done last. People don't realize that because that, that was to fill in what the lost 116 pages were. So we're going to read the Book of Mormon chronologically. And uh, so that's that's a, in this method, I think I have one here. Um, no, I got a, I do have an edition of the Book of Mormon that Mosiah is the first book in there. So that's a critical mm -hmm. text of the Book of Mormon. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I, I intend on doing it. What happened was that Nehemia was in Germany, and then um, and and so that uh, until just earlier this month, and then we were going to have Brent Metcalf come on, who was one of the leading um, scholars about the whole Messiah priority, who wrote a okay. ground groundbreaking paper on it that kind of basically shifted the whole conversation from saying that the uh, first Nephi was the first it was the first Nephi priority was became now has become the minority position that most scholars before had a different priority but then it was a minority position but brett metcalf's work kind of made that like mainstream and even that was royal scouts and royal scouts and basically looked at brett metcalf's work and that convinced him that the mosiah priority is the correct order of things in many ways so the idea is is to have but unfortunately brent has run into some medical issues uh so that's why we haven't started taping what we want to do is we want to start off the very first episode where we talk about what is the mosiah priority and then have some of the top. And then what we're going to do is we're going to read through the Book of Mormon, and we're going to have some of the top scholars of more the Book of Mormon come on and read through it with us. Okay. So I feel like that I I love the idea that people are going to witness me reading the Book of Mormon cover to cover for the first time on camera mm -hmm. and with an audience. I think that, that okay. that'll be pretty exciting. Yeah, I think so too. So that's kind of the game plan right now is to do that. But we just got delayed because of uh, Nehemiah's trip. We were going to try to tape some stuff before he headed out, but there were issues then. 
So, and I just talked with Brent. I got to reach out to him maybe even after this conversation to find out how he's doing. Cause he, he ran into, he's been having, he's been having struggles with his health the last few years. And so he, he, he wasn't able to tape anything last week. Cause I was hoping to tape something with him last week, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the latest on that. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a cool project. And you know, this channel's moved away from doing book reviews primarily yeah. because I only have two book reviews that have over a thousand views. Mm-hmm. So I realized very quickly that it's the interviews and I didn't know that I was any good at interviewing, but apparently I'm pretty good at it. So you've read over around a, over a thousand Mormon uh, Mormonism books. You've read a good deal of the Book of Mormon. Um, so you know a lot about Mormonism. So I have a question for you. What do you think people who haven't read the Book of Mormon, let's say Christians, evangelicals, or even like people of different religions, what would they be surprised to find in the Book of Mormon? Or what would they take from the Book of Mormon that like... Yeah, I guess I guess what would they be surprised to find in the Book of Mormon? That Jesus is the center of the story. Mm, okay. That Jesus is the central message of the Book of Mormon. Jesus Christ crucified in his resurrection to save humanity. I never to me the idea that there would be a post-resurrection Jesus who's here on earth for 40 days, the idea that he wouldn't be going around to other peoples throughout the world seems more ridiculous to me than than him just staying in Palestine, right? So for me, I almost feel like the idea that there that Jesus would have gone around and talked to different people throughout the world is not a foreign concept to me. It seems mm-hmm. like a fair and just thing that there that there's these there's this whole other continent that the Bible writers don't know anything about mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. maybe yeah. Jesus would find his way there. I don't think that's mm-hmm. so far off. Yeah. So the idea that Jesus would do that makes sense to me. And and then honestly, you find that Jesus permeates all the other religions, unlike the other way around. There are Buddhists who have integrated Jesus into their into their world. Hindus, uh, all these different religions have to uh, do grapple with Jesus. And we do have ancient. We have groups that go way back that have like a connection to Jesus around Jesus's time. I mean, there's a village in Japan that claims that they're descendants of Jesus, right? So it's kind of interesting just to 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 to, to know that Jesus kind of did make his way around the world, whether it was literally while he was doing his 40 day post resurrection ministry, or figuratively. There's no doubt that Jesus has had an impact throughout the world. And that and, and, and almost every tribe and tongue that there is has in many ways has encountered Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so I think the Book of Mormon really is that story of a people who encounter Jesus that the biblical writers are not aware of. And that makes sense to me. And that's why the idea that maybe we have other civilizations that Jesus came to and maybe other records of those engagements will come forth as well. I mean, mm-hmm. that's not. To me, now for a lot of Christians, that's like blasphemy. Oh, like, well, you can't add to the Bible. And it's like, we all know that's not, look, the book of Revelation, the book of Deuteronomy make it very clear. If we're going to have that interpretation, then even a lot of the books in the Bible shouldn't be, have been added in there, right? But the reality yeah. is, is that I think as a charismatic Christian, I don't, I'm not, look, I think people who say that the, you could argue that the people who say that the canon is closed are the ultimate papists, the ultimate followers of the Roman Catholic Church. And, and I'm using this little bit of uh, provocative language because a lot of these people are very anti-Catholic. But the reality is, is that if you go and say the canon is closed, you are following the Council of Trent. And the Council of Trent was part of the counter-reformation to counter our, what, our, what my people were trying to do. And for the wow. for people of the Reformation tradition to fall hook, line, and sinker for a doctrine that was is taught by the Catholic Church saying that the, the, the canon is closed mm-hmm. tells me that if anything, you are at, at the core of your being a papist. And again, that's a harsh word, but I'm using it only because those are, that's the kind of language that reformers would make about, you know, okay. being yeah. people who are followers of, of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. And a lot of these people who are critics of mine come from the reformed tradition and they're very anti-Catholic. But if you're taking the core doctrine, one of the key doctrines of the Council of Trent, and integrating it into your belief system, you're at the core center of it in many ways is Roman Catholicism. So my whole thing is is that I think it's a grave error and a grave mistake for any group to say that they can tell God how he can communicate to his people. He can, If he wants to give us new scripture, guess what? He can do that. No Amen. institution, no church can go to God and say, no, we're not interested because we close the canon. No, that's not our job. 
Yeah. If God yeah. wants to speak to us today, whether it's through a young farm boy who encounters plates or he wants to talk to us and, and give us even new scripture to this day, I can't, I'm not going to go and say, well, no, that can't be because then I'm limiting God. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's really not Christian. Yeah. And I think one thing that people really don't understand about the Book of Mormon is what it's saying is that, um, you know, in the Old Testament, God made all these promises that he would come to his people. Well, then his people were scattered. And so the Book of Mormon is saying, hey, like this is this is um, a group of his people, you know, the a group of the, the house of Israel that came over here. And he fulfilled his promise to come visit them. He didn't just go to Jerusalem. He came here too. And there are, I mean, I haven't looked into it very much, but I know that there are legends that um, after his resurrection, Jesus visited peasants in Russia. Uh, there's a painting I've seen about it, that, that he came and, and, and shared the, like the, the message of, of the gospel with them too. And so it just, it just makes sense to me that he would do that. But, uh, and something else I'm really curious about is you've mentioned um, another thing I haven't look, looked into very much, but I think is very interesting that you've mentioned um, is about the verses that have been added to the Bible. When you're talking about adding to the Bible and you talk about Protestants adding to the Bible, can you tell us a little more about that? Well, that's great. That's a great question. By the way, I also want to add that there was a Christian author who in the 1950s wrote a book called He Walked the Americas. And this is a person who was saying that Jesus came and ministered to the Native Americans. Um, and this was a person who did not believe in the Book of Mormon. So, so even within the Christian tradition, there's this idea that Jesus, this is not just a distinctly Mormon idea. This is actually something that other Christians have felt as a possibility as well. So we got to talk about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's called He Walked the Americas. I believe it's still in print. I think maybe even Wayne May might be selling that in his, on his uh, catalog. So, um, yeah, you know, so there are verses that have been, there have, been, there are books, there are verses that have been added to scripture that are not in the original manuscripts. One is the long ending of Mark, and two is what's called the Yohim Koma in 1 John, which talks about the Trinity. Now, this did not exist in the original Greek or Latin manuscripts, and there were people, but that verse, the Yohim Koma, made its way into the Bible, but Erasmus, when he was doing his translation of the Bible, did his translation using the original manuscripts and didn't have that verse in there. And basically... They were like, why isn't this verse in here? And he's like, because it's not in the original manuscripts. And they're like, well, lo and behold, somebody at the monastery down the road found a manuscript. Well, very convenient, right? So we all know, and, and even Erasmus knew that this is a dubious origin, but he put it in there anyhow. So now we have, the, the, we have these people who want to say, I'm a King James only Christian and believes that the 1611 edition of the King James is the true version of the Bible. And I know many people like that. And there are many people in the Mormon community kind of believe that too, King James only, right? You know, that's their only scriptures that they use. And there's many evangelicals, many fundamentalists that have this view about the King James Version Bible too. And they have to grapple with the fact that there's a verse in their Bible that's only a couple hundred years older than the Book of Mormon. That's the reality based on scholarship. So that that's that's interesting to me. Like, okay, and then the long ending of Mark. You know, there was a lot of stuff that was added at the very end of Mark. And, and most of your modern translations will say, and most of the original documents, these verses were not there. So we know that verses got into the Bible that weren't in the original manuscripts. And so how can we then say that, well, we'll accept those, those verses function as scripture for most Christians? But why can't we say that the Book of Mormon could also function as scripture too? But not only that, in that 1611 edition of the of the King James Bible, it also included the Apocrypha, the mm -hmm. Catholic, you know, the De or what, the, or what yeah. the Catholics call the Deuterocanonical books. So what do you do with that? Right. That's that's another great question. So eventually, the Apocrypha makes its way out of most of the Protestant Bibles. There are still some Protestant churches that still have the Apocrypha, but for the most part, most of the evangelical fundamentalist Christians basically just use the 66 books as their as their as, as their as their scriptures but at the same time there are many evangelicals and many Christians who also will say that Catholics are Christians but that they have extra books so why can why can we say Catholics are Christian and they can have extra books but we can't say that Mormons are Christian because they they have extra books it's just weird mm -hmm. like I'm not making the claim I'm not making this blanket statement that all Mormons are Christians no because again we've we've established it's not about the building it's not about the institution it's about the body of Christ and it is it is an organism like you said not an organization I like that analogy and I think most people I think that resonates with most people I think there are many people who are evangelicals 
But I tell people, so there are atheists who will give me the shirt, uh, give me the shirt off their back, and there are Christians who will stab me in the back. That's mm -hmm. the reality. And so, so mm -hmm. even even if an atheist, you know, there are atheists where I see the fruits of the spirit, right? You have to look at it this way: God looks at us in our completed form. He doesn't look at us where we're at. He looks at us at, at, at in our completed form. So when I see an atheist or a Hindu or a Buddhist or any number of people, and I see the fruits of the spirit from them. I feel that's like a glimpse of looking at that person in their completed form, mm -hmm. right? And so, so to me, that's how I look at it. Like, like when you see Jesus in somebody, um, embrace that, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I really yeah. feel like God sees that he's mm -hmm. giving us the opportunity to see the fellow image bearers in their completed form. When we see the fruits of the spirit exhibited from these people, that's what I think is really the most important takeaway is looking yeah. at that way. Yeah. Yeah. And we should do what we can to nurture that and encourage that, like encourage each other in Christ instead of um, saying you're wrong and you're, and you're not a Christian to, to have the mindset of how can I help this person become more of a Christian? Like my, and, and look at ourselves, what we need to, what we need to overcome and, and, and be humble about because of our own weakness and then love this other person so that we can help them come closer to Jesus Christ too. But yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's funny because the Quakers have this idea of uh, us all having an inner light. And I think it's a beautiful thing. We all, and that inner light to me is the um, is is the image bearer. We all have that inner light. We all have that image, that God breathed image in all of us. And so I feel like first and foremost, it's not you know, yeah, let's help them become a better Christian, but let's help them become a better image bearer. Let them embrace the, 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 a lot of people feel degraded. A lot of people don't know that there's that inner light, that divine spark that's in them. And we need to let, help them find that. And I think once people embrace the idea that they are created in the image of the creator and that they are divine image bearers, once they recognize that that's within them, then that would enable them to then start having a conversation with the divine. And I think ultimately, and I, this is what I believe, I believe that the people who end up in heaven get there because of the sacrifice that Jesus did for us at the cross. That's the only way to heaven in one sense. But I think that that is much more, uh, I think God is much more greater and bigger than limiting us to just the church building that we go to on Sunday. We're the true ones and everybody else isn't. I think God is much greater and grander. And I think he's much more loving than we could even comprehend. And so I, I do have I mean, if if there is a hell, I don't think there's a whole lot of people in there, to be honest with you, because I think if if God if Christ sacrificed and only a handful of people end up in 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 eternity, I consider that a failure. I think that God is much broader in His love than we could possibly imagine, and that all 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 His children, um, all His children will hear His voice. All the seekers will find Him, and and they'll find Him in their own way. And I'm not going to judge somebody who finds it in a different way than me. Um, but if I see the fruits of the spirit exhibited, then I have to say, okay, I think that's, well, one, for sure, a fellow image bearer, but also two, I see the the Christ working through that image bearer, you know, however you call it. Yeah. Amen. So like Steve, um, you've asked, you ask a lot of people on your channel, what are their three, you know, those three questions. So if you don't mind, we're going to ask you the same three questions. <laughs> okay. What, first of all, what is your favorite Bible story? My favorite Bible story. Okay, now that's always a great question because a lot of people say, "Well, Jesus healing people, right?" Or just, just talk about Jesus in general. And I think that that's that's the key, you know, thing is Jesus, of course, is in the center of that. And I'd have to let me think here for a second. My favorite Bible story because you know sometimes different stories resonate with you at different times in your life. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that I think we need to look at Lamentations. All we are is dust in the wind. We think we're big and we're important, right? We think that this important this this period of time is the most important time in the history of human humanity. Why? Because I live in it, right? Mm -hmm. And we think that well, we're on the cusp of the end times. Why? Because I just happen to be here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I and I look at it this way that you know we all are just dust in the wind. And fifty years from now, a hundred years from now, nobody will remember us. Yeah. And our gravestones will probably be unattended. And it will probably they'll they'll turn to rubble at some point. And they will become dust in the wind. So any monument, any anything that we think that we can build here on this earth is all gonna crumble. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think it's important that we have the humility to recognize that you think you're important. No, you're not. Um, you're just, you're, we're all on this journey together. We're all fellow image bearers. And to put yourself above other people, um, you know, a thousand years from now, when they write the history of our people, there's probably somebody they're going to be writing about that we've never even heard of. Mm -hmm. We think the important people are, no, it, it's probably somebody we've never even heard of. That would be the most important period of person in this period of time. So I think we just have to be have that humility. So I think the book of Lamentations really just talks, just gets to the brass tacks, right? Okay. And, you know, yeah. So that that's 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 one. I think uh, one thing. Okay. And then you can ask the second question. I'm sorry. Well, I, I I like that because that's exactly what King Benjamin talks about. He says, like I, he's like I'm this great king, but I'm just the, we're all the the dust of the earth, and we're all gonna go. We're all gonna die. We're all gonna go return to our mother earth, and so. Yeah, I I really like that. Um, so number two, what is your favorite Book of Mormon story? Well, you know, and I I, I think that to me the idea of the in Third Nephi it talks about that there's no there were and there were no more matter of ites. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what preceded? So what comes out of there being no more matter of ites? Well, I call it the proto millennium, a two hundred year period of living Christian principles, having a civil society. And the Book of Mormon actually tells us how it was done. And one of the ways that it was done is that people put aside their ites. Mm -hmm. And the problem that I have that I see in our world is that there's Brighamites and Josephites, there's Strangites and there's Cutlerites and there's Bickertonites and all these matter of ites. And this is kind mm -hmm. of previewing the speak uh, to what I'm going to talk about at the Book of Mormon rally or actually at the Firm Foundation is, is Zion or is the restoration ready for Zion? Because the Book of Mormon makes it very clear that there have to be no more matter of ites. But within the mm -hmm. Restoration, I see a lot of ites. But guess what? I see a lot of Protestantites. I see a lot mm -hmm. of Catholicites. I see a lot of Progressiveites. I see a lot of Conservativites. Hmm. Yeah. Are we as a people, as a body of Christ, are we ready for Zion? So for me, I think that that's probably one of the most important. That that verse always stuck. There were no right. more matter of ites, and I think that's an important thing that I want to key on because I think there's some some there there's wisdom in that verse i like yeah. that too because yeah, i think you've got something there lynn reidenauer actually mentioned that i think in his in his sermon um he's talking about and he i think he actually said that that's his favorite book of mormon passage too and um so yeah because he's coming at it from the same position you know as an evangelical and um so who is jesus to you okay so he is my lord and savior um he is He's also fully human and fully divine. Um, he is the second member of the Trinity, and he uh, he saved he saved my life. Not only did he save my life in many ways by using Mormonism to save my life, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but also he saved my eternal life by the sacrifice that he made at the cross. Now this is complicated because some people think it's controversial about having a human sacrifice, and I get that. But I think even if we just want to broaden it out and just kind of go like. Not necessarily, uh, like a, I'm going to make a more of a secular argument that, okay, whether Jesus di died and was fully human and fully God, and that He rose from the dead, we can still look at Jesus as being uh, for humanity. He can be a guide of that is what ultimately is about is being human is self sacrifice and denial of oneself. So even if you mm -hmm. don't believe in God, that Jesus is the perfect example of one who would willingly sacrifice himself to be an example to humanity that it's one, it's not about you, um, that you need to also, you know, like he, like Jesus said, no greater love than, than a friend who would give his life, uh, than a friend who would say, give his life for another friend. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so, so there are atheists in, in wartime who jumped on hand grenades to save their fellow companions. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No greater love. So if that atheist, his last act is sacrifice, Okay, I, I'm sorry, but I think he's in heaven, you know, personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and so that's kind of how I see it, you know, is is, is just looking for uh, that. So I used to say that Jesus ultimately um, is our Lord and Savior. And I want to share with you a painting that was sent. This is a print, but we're going to get a full frame painting. This is a vision that a Latter-day Saint had of Jesus. And if you look, he's got the, the prints on both his wrist and hand, which mm -hmm. is probably the correct way that he was crucified. And it's called Jesus Christ is within our grasp. He's here mm -hmm. for you. I and this is, wow. uh, this is the website, lordtakemyham.com. And uh, so it was a Latter-day Saint had this vision. And then he then commissioned this painting. I had a professional painter uh, paint that. 
So I think that's that's beautiful, and 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 I think yeah, is within all of our grasp. And mm -hmm. I think that's the that's the key takeaway that we need to have. And this, of course, we're filming this during Holy Week, the most important week on the Christian calendar, as we yeah. approach uh, Easter. Um, I think it's really important that we keep that in mind. What he did for us for the at the cross, the suffering. So the Catholics have the crucifix with Jesus suffering. Well, that's fine because he did suffer for us. The Protestants have the empty cross because we want to talk more about the risen Christ than we want to talk about the Christ. Of the, well, that's good too. The Latter-day Saints like to talk about the Garden of Gethsemane. That was mm -hmm. the beginning of the atonement. Well, that's that's another aspect too. Mm -hmm. um, the Eastern Orthodox actually like to talk about the Mount, the transfiguration of Jesus, that that was like, like that was the, the, an important event in Jesus. So all these different manifestations of Christianity look, take something out from the Jesus story and and make, and make that important. I think all of those aspects of the atonement, all of those aspects of Jesus are important for us to take into our walk. I don't think we should just say, well, I won't, you know, just the Jesus on the crucifix. That's the only one I'm going to worship or the empty cross or the empty tomb or no, it's like, no, it's all part of the story. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and and so I think that we need to embrace all of the ways we look at Jesus and, and look at through through multiple lenses. And I think the beautiful thing about Christianity is each aspect of Christianity kind of gives us a different lens to look at, but ultimately it's telling the same story. At the very center of our faith is Christ crucified. Everything else, to quote Joseph Smith, is an appendage. Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love that. Thanks for thanks for coming on, Steve. It was great to spend time with you guys a couple months ago when you were in town, and I hope to see you guys soon as well. Yes. Yeah, same here. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for watching. We had a great conversation with Steve, and I encourage you to go check out his YouTube channel, Mormon Book Reviews, where he has a lot of great interviews. He actually interviewed us a couple of months ago, so I encourage you to go check that out as well. But I just wanted to end with saying that although we talk about all this stuff about Christianity and the Book of Mormon and the Bible and all this other stuff, that's not our main focus. Our main focus is to convert people to Jesus Christ and nothing else because he is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is our hope.